So welcome uh, to all of you to the IDA Excellence uh, Lecture. Um, so that's really a pleasure today to have uh, Professor Fadei Kihans, who is a Professor of Computer Science at uh, Linköping University in Sweden. Uh, he's really a, a leader of, of, of topics that we will see today though, that's about reasoning and learning and uh, trustworthy uh, AI. Uh, he is uh, involved in several, uh, let's say, uh, activities in uh, AI, both in education and research. And uh, what is really, uh, we are really happy to, to have him today because he's also a, a coordinator of the Taylor uh, Network, uh, which is part of the, uh, so which is also, let's say, a, a great member of uh, AIDA uh, and uh, really uh, uh, making a lot of activities uh, and support to, to the AIDA activities. So it's a really, a, a really a great pleasure to have you, Frédéric. Uh, uh, and uh, I give you now the, the floor and I remind to all the people that the, the meeting is recorded. You could ask the questions when you, when you want on the, on the chat. And uh, so please, Frédéric, that's uh, the floor. Thanks again. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. So it's a great pleasure to be here uh, and I'm uh, really happy to, to give this talk. So basically what I want to do in, in this talk is to uh, uh, connect this concept of trustworthy AI and uh, connect that to this the need for integrating of reasoning and learning uh, to the main AI paradigms uh, the last 50 years. And uh, what I want to do is of course uh, show some concrete examples, both from my own uh, research uh, but also from uh, the Taylor project uh, where we are uh, developing the scientific foundations for trustworthy AI through the integration of reasoning, learning and optimization. So of course, I mean, the, the background is, I mean, you all know this, of course, that what we see today is tremendous progress in AI, that we see all this very uh, fascinating and um, uh, interesting applications of, of uh, AI technology uh, in everything from uh, computer games beating the, the best humans uh, in games like poker and chess and Go and Jeopardy and Starcraft and Duta and uh, yeah, just wait a few few weeks uh, or months and you will see that we, we have lost in yet another game. And these self-driving cars uh, that there was a lot of talk about for five, uh, ten years ago. Uh, and of course, everyone was promising that around now, about 2020, 2025, uh, we will have all these self-driving cars on our streets. Uh, of course, in reality, that turned out to be a much more challenging problem. Uh, and I mean, even if you're able to say solve maybe 80% of the problem, that's still not enough uh, to actually be able to do this at, at large scale. Uh, so there is still major challenges when it comes to uh, really pushing the boundaries and, and, and uh, reaching uh, kind of uh, human performance in, in this more unstructured and much more complex environments compared to, to games. Um, so, so that is one background. I think if we also look at a bit more on the kind of uh, specifics, I mean, what are the, the, the technologies, what are the applications that really have made a difference in the last five or 10 years? Uh, I would say that most of the, the progress that we have seen has been very much in, in these areas that we would call perception or understanding the world around us, for example, through computer vision. Uh, so uh, understanding if finding objects in, in images or uh, tracking people or cars or other objects through video sequences and uh, try generating captions uh, given an image or giving a, a video and so on. Uh, and of course also voice recognition. So dealing with sound uh, in, in all its forms. And we've also seen tremendous progress there and in natural language processing basically being able to uh, translate between different languages, being able to uh, structure, organize, answer questions related to this uh, very broad uh, textual uh, databases and so on. And of course, we've also seen uh, interesting and, and uh, quite impressive results when it comes to text generation. But again, uh, just as we see with this self-driving cars, uh, even though the progress uh, is, is really stunning and, and has made huge leaps forward, there's still so many obstacles uh, to actually apply this uh, in really the robust and what you say, safe manner. And I really also think that of course, the more sophisticated our application becomes, the more integrated they become in our daily lives and the more that we depend on them for different types of 
uh, applications and, and usages, of course, the more important it will be that we can actually trust that they work as we expect them to work. And uh, we also will put much more higher uh, constraints or uh, um, uh, demands on these systems in different ways. And that is what we see today, uh, this push towards, for example, trustworthy AIS, as we call it here in Europe. Uh, and I really think one of the really key challenges is this, how do we evaluate AI systems? And I really think this is a very fascinating problem. Uh, and the example I usually use is this from, from the AlphaGo games between uh, Google DeepMind's AlphaGo and KG uh, in 2016, uh, where, where there were a number of times during these games where the best human experts basically thought that the computer made a, a mistake that uh, basically saying something along the lines of that, haha, um, a human would never play like that. Of course, the computer must made a mistake. Uh, and uh, as you all know, uh, of course, the, the computer won, which means that this was objectively a good move. So objectively, given the, the rules of the game, this was a good move. But from our human perspective, this looked like it was actually a bad move because it was not the move that we normally do. And I really think here we have one major challenge uh, when it comes to AI system is that uh, often when we evaluate these systems, we're not really evaluating them against some objective uh, ground truth because it's of course very difficult to obtain in most cases, but rather we compare it against our own way of doing things. And I mean, now it was the case of, of Go. I mean, it's just a recreational game, even though people, of course, take it seriously. But imagine now that instead of a uh, Go uh, uh, playing computer, uh, assume that this was now a medical diagnostic system. And that uh, this uh, medical diagnostic system is giving advice to a human doctor. And it is advising that, oh, it's giving a recommendation about the, the treatment, for example, of a particular patient. And uh, from the doctor's perspective, this recommendation might seem completely out of the blue, something that this doctor would never uh, think about and, and probably never recommend. And now th this system is, is now it reached a very interesting state because uh, assuming now that the doctor uh, uh, um, uh, don't follow the advice because it, from, from his or her perspective, it sounds like bad advice. But in the end, it turns out that this was actually the right diagnostic or the right treatment. Then we have an issue. Uh, but it could also equally be that the, the doctor trusts the system, follows the advice, and it actually turns out to be bad advice. And then we have this equally bad situation. So we really have this major issue on how should we interpret the output of these systems and on what grounds should we actually do what these systems recommend us to do. Or if they, if they do it directly, of course, then, then we don't even have a chance to intervene. But, but I really think this is kind of the core problem. And, and I think that is also why we see that there is a lot of interest in these uh, interpretable uh, systems or explainable systems, so on, because that's the way humans do it. When we enter, uh, find ourselves in this situation, for example, if you are one doctor talking to another medical doctor, and uh, th that other medical doctor is giving you a, a recommendation that you, for you, it's, it sounds uh, quite strange, then you will ask him or her to explain uh, why they thought about this. So that's why we're thinking about the same way for these systems. And I wonder if that is the right way of doing it, but it's definitely the way that we approach it from a human perspective. But I really think this is a super interesting problem and, and actually a very core problem to a lot of AI applications. Uh, so, uh, I think that also uh, Europe has taken a very uh, clear and I would argue very good stance in that, yes, we do want AI in Europe, but we don't want any AI. We want AI that, first of all, it's what, what we call human-centered, and secondly, it also should be trustworthy. And uh, I have been part of this high-level expert group where we define these ethical guidelines for trustworthy AI. And, and basically what we defined uh, this to mean is that there are three things that need to be satisfied. First of all, uh, the systems, the AI system needs to satisfy the applicable rules and regulations, which again is one of these things that sound completely obvious, but actually if you think about it, for example, taking the self-driving car as an example, uh, and that uh, you might be in a situation 
where you uh, might uh, estimate, oh, there is a risk of ending up in an accident unless I, for example, uh, drive over a, a solid line. So maybe I'm crossing into the opposite uh, lane or doing something that's violating a traffic rule in order to avoid an accident. And uh, assume now that there is no accident. How do you afterwards argue that uh, I needed uh, to, to violate or the system needed to violate this traffic rule in order to avoid accident? So actually, I think in some sense, I wouldn't be surprised if from the, the manufacturer of this uh, self-driving car, it actually might be better uh, to, to have an, uh, what you say, a slight accident than to break the rules. And uh, I do think that's yet another one of these interesting questions. Uh, the second, uh, of course, the, 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 the end goal is, of course, to never end up in a situation where you need to make these choices, but I do think that they may still uh, occur in practice. Uh, the second part is that uh, these systems should satisfy a number of ethical principles. So we define four ethical principles. Uh, and, uh, but satisfying these two, I mean, being lawful and satisfying these ethical requirements or principles is not enough. And I really think this is where these guidelines stands out compared to others. And that is that good intentions are not enough. You actually need to have a safe and robust implementation so that you actually realize uh, these principles uh, in practice. So, so taking together these three, uh, if your system satisfies these, then you, you can argue that it is uh, worthy of trust. Then, of course, the really challenging part here is not defining these ethical principles. There is a number of different organizations that have done that. Uh, but the really challenging part is how do we actually realize this? How do we operationalize these principles? Uh, and what we did in the high-level group was that we took two further steps. First of all, we defined requirements. So we defined several requirements based on these uh, principles. And secondly, we also did uh, created an assessment list uh, with questions that you can use internally to evaluate whether you are satisfying these uh, requirements or not. Uh, and uh, both of these are exist. I mean, uh, are publicly available as deliverables. So, so we did take a number of steps, but I really think there is so many more steps needed to take in order to realize this vision, and that's what I want to talk more about. Uh, moving forward. So, so the four uh, ethical principles are uh, respect for human autonomy, meaning that we want these systems to augment, complement, and empower people rather than replace them or uh, uh, yeah, replace them. Uh, and so I really think this is, of course, a key thing. And here again, we have interesting cases of, for example, nudging. So many of you might have an app which is uh, trying to get you to eat healthier or exercise more regularly or something like that. And uh, these applications are probably quite unproblematic because you have configured them. You have installed them, you have configured them, you are uh, deciding to, to follow their uh, advice and so on. But now imagine a situation where your insurance company says that, oh, if you install this, um, uh, app to, to make you eat healthier and to exercise more, we will reduce your premium with, say, 20%. Now it's becoming a bit more questionable. Uh, is this, uh, are they overriding your autonomy or not? Or you can, might even consider a, a, a state doing this. And uh, because, of course, they want to improve the health of the population. But then it becomes uh, even more uh, challenging to, to, to consider that. So I really think this uh, is an interesting one. The second uh, one is prevention of harm. I think this is probably the least, <laughs> least controversial in any, every respect. And of course, we want our systems to be safe and secure and protect our physical and mental uh, integrity and well-being. Uh, the third is fairness. So fairness is, again, one of these concepts which basically everyone agrees that, yes, we want our systems to be fair, meaning that they should have equal and just distribution of both benefits and costs. However, when it comes to the practicalities of actually defining it in more detailed, uh, say a bit more mathematical uh, perspective, then suddenly it realized there are many different ways of realizing fairness. And, uh, and, and then it becomes less uh, obvious how to approach this. Uh, and fourth, uh, and definitely not least, is explicability. And this is all about being able to understand how these systems work so that they are transparent about their functionality, that they're open with their capabilities, 
um, and of course that you also know who is behind these systems and so on. And here we also have this concept of explanation or explainable uh, AI, which is a very popular term, which again, I do think is, is quite challenging from a number of different perspectives. Uh, first of all, in the sense that, I mean, uh, how do we know that the explanation actually is a true explanation and just, not just after the fact uh, 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 description? So, so I do think there is a lot of challenges in, for example, evaluating and studying the quality uh, of explanations and, and I also think uh, I mean from we have done some work on explainability and to me I think the really interesting or the important part here is as a user what I usually want is to be able to do something for example I mean the, the classical example is that you you get some decision for example you you apply for a bank loan and you get the a negative um, your, your your loan is denied and then, of course, be, getting an explanation of why is only relevant if it allows you to change something. What do I need to do in order to get a, a, a get my bank loan approved? That is, of course, what you want to uh, achieve. So, so I really think these these explanations is really a relation between the person getting the uh, explanation and the system. I don't really believe in kind of pure explanations of the system, uh, but, but that's a different. So, so the, the point here is that each of these, uh, which on the surface are very obvious, and I do think basically everyone agrees upon, but if you start scratching the surface, if you start to try to define and try to implement and realize these, then you realize that, hey, this is actually quite tricky. And of course, as a researchers, that is exactly what makes us excited and, and realize that how can we develop technical solutions to actually satisfy these principles? That I think is really one of the major uh, challenges that we have in, in AI research today, because I would argue that each of these principles requires significant amount of research in order to be achieved. And of course, now we see also regulation being proposed based on uh, these kind of uh, um, uh, principles. So, so we have the, the European AI Act that has been proposed here uh, almost a year ago, where they have this risk-based approach, where they basically prohibit certain uh, applications which are considered to have unacceptable risks, such as uh, mass surveillance or uh, subliminal uh, manipulation and so on. And then these high-risk applications where human uh, life or human well-being or well humans in general are are really affected by these systems uh, and here they're putting a lot of constraints and a lot of uh, uh, really trying to push the, the the lower bar when it comes to the quality uh, of these systems uh, and to a large degree based on these requirements from from these ethical guidelines and then the, the expectation is that actually this will be a relatively a small set of applications, while the vast majority of applications will be considered uh, low or, or, or even no risk application. So, so of course, that is the, the intention. Uh, my, my personal, what should I say, view or, or expectation here is that I do believe probably that more application will be considered high risk than probably what has been anticipated from the start. Uh, and probably either because the, the, the developers don't want to take any risks, so they treat it as if it is a high risk application just in case, or it might be from those buying or procuring these systems that they, they, they might be unsure. So let's be on the safe side and, and put these requirements on the system. So, so I, I do think it probably would be quite difficult to, to, to draw these lines, uh, but at least that's the, the, the EU approach. So of course, now we come to the, to the kind of next part, namely, I mean, how do we actually approach uh, these problems? Uh, and, and I really think it's, it's important here to, to take a step back and, and look also about how humans uh, think and not only how computers, uh, well, I wouldn't argue they think, but how they process and, and make decisions. And, and here we have this uh, book that I think many of you have heard about uh, from Daniel Kahneman who won uh, the, the Nobel Prize in economics a number of years back. Uh, and in this book, he basically studies I mean, what are all the, what should we say, uh, interesting uh, challenges or, or problems that occur because that we have these two different systems uh, of making uh, decisions. So, so uh, in this system uh, two uh, decision-making, everything is basically this deliberate, conscious, uh, explicit reasoning. 
And I would argue this is the, the kind of uh, um, uh, prototypical analytical uh, reasoning that, that we uh, as humans uh, often uh, want to do or, or that we uh, admire in people who manage to do them well. Uh, and, and I really think that this was the kind of the type of problems, the type of uh, thinking or cognitive processes that a lot of AI research has been focusing on. Uh, and, and that's we, we, we now call this kind of reasoning approaches where you have this explicit goal, you have an explicit model of the world, and then you explicitly reason about what steps, what, what operations should you do or what uh, um, uh, 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 conclusions should you draw in from this information. So really this deductive and abductive uh, reasoning. Uh, and of course, I would argue that this has been very successful uh, in solving that particular type of problem. At the same time, uh, we have this system one, which is this more automatic, effortless, and uh, uh, unconscious uh, type of uh, decision making. And, and I think that the most common example here is intuition. That if you someone asks you a question, you intuitively uh, have an answer to that question, and or or they get uh, ask you to solve a problem, and you intuitively get an answer to that problem, which in many cases is probably a very good answer, or maybe even the, the correct answer. But of course, it may also uh, be completely off the, the books and completely wrong. And, and uh, uh, so I think this is the this state where we have this more data-driven, uh, often machine learning-based systems, which are really good in finding these kind of patterns, which in many cases are, are very correct, but sometimes it is, fails uh, spectacularly. And we also don't have this kind of introspection into how these uh, how these models actually work, which I, I would argue is, is, is slightly a, a not true in the sense that, of course, we understand mathematically exactly how, for example, these deep neural networks work. I mean, it's just a mathematical function. So, of course, we know all the steps being done. However, we're really poor in understanding these multi-million dimensional spaces and understanding these hyperplanes. Oops. Uh, in these multi-million dimensional spaces, and what do they actually mean? Uh, uh, so, I mean, I do actually think that the problem here of explaining that is actually more a problem of abstraction. That's too much detail for us to, to really understand, and that we really need to reduce this uh, and abstract away what are the core or the kind of key pieces here and understand them. So I do think abstraction is actually one of the really important parts in order to achieve this kind of understanding. But uh, I also think that what we are really trying to achieve here is how can we combine these two different approaches, uh, the more say knowledge driven model based uh, reasoning based approaches with this more data driven learning based approaches and combine them so we get the best from both that we get the guarantees that we get from these more formal systems together with this more adaptation and flexibility and, uh, and uh, so on that we get from these more data-driven learning-based systems. Of course, that is what we really want to achieve. How can we combine this in, in, in a good way? Uh, so, so what I now is going to give some examples from, from my own research. So, so, I mean, the first example here is really about how do we make autonomous systems safe and uh, we have been working a lot with kind of more formal verification or runtime verification using this formal uh, temporal logic based approaches. Uh, but what we have done in, in the last couple of years, well, a number of years back actually now, uh, was that we have integrated this with a learning component. So you can use a generative learning component or well, you can use any probabilistic approach or you can also use Kalman filters or something like that to learn probabilistic representations of the world and then you can combine that with this runtime verification. So we can actually verify uh, this. So we can combine this probabilistic and logic uh, representations, but also that we can use these generative models that we can learn to do predictions about the future. And then we can monitor not only the observed past, but also the likely future based on our, our, our learned models. So, so we then extended these, these uh, uh, formalisms to both doing this kind of reasoning of under, under over uncertainty, which of course has been done by, by, by many other people as well, but also doing this reasoning over predictions. So, so uh, I really think what's interesting here is of course that we get a much more fine grained uh, granularity and allows us to 
uh, ask questions or pose questions to the system that is much more fine grained. So, for example, if we have, for example, we want to monitor that our uh, UAV is always flying at least three meters of altitude, which I mean, there is often these kind of requ requirements. Uh, uh, and if we just use a kind of standard logical formula, we have a particular probability distribution of the actual altitude of the UAV. And we see that the, the most probable or the, the kind of uh, mean of this probability distribution is above three meters. So if we only consider this, we would say it's true. However, if we now add this, that we want to be very sure, very certain about our reasoning, for example, that it should be at least 99% likely, uh, the probability should be at least 99% that we are above three meters. Then, uh, because that uh, the sufficient amount of probability distribution is below three meters, this will then be false. So this gives us a clear extension in expressibility. And then what we we'll also do is that we add that we can talk about not only the current time point, but also either predicted future time points or previous time points so that we can refer both to past and future events. And then it allows us to, to say that it should always be the case that we will expect to be above this uh, altitude two time units ahead of us. So that we're, we're, we're not only monitoring uh, up to now, but we're also monitoring the likely future so that we can detect if something goes wrong and then we can act on it in advance. And I think this is actually, I mean, the, the first two parts are kind of straightforward in the sense that we can now uh, have probabilistic reasoning. But the second is also this, that we can do this anticipatory reasoning so that we can actually take likely future events into account when we make the decisions about now. And then the third, which I actually do think is the most interesting one, is that we can start to reason about our predictions. We can actually start to monitor the quality of either our learning system or our tracking system or our, our control system, because we, now we can start comparing what we predicted, we, for example, where we predicted we would be compared to where we actually ended up. And if this, this deviates too much, it means that there's something wrong with your, with your state estimation, for example. Uh, and then you can deal with this. Or that uh, you, you, you did some action and you expected to, to make a certain maneuver, but you didn't uh, do that kind of maneuver. You did something else. Then, oh, there's something wrong with our controller and we could do something about it. So I really think that's some, some interesting applications of these kind of uh, mm -hmm. techniques. The second technique I wanted to talk about is really this, that uh, where what we see today is that there is a large number of very uh, kind of uh, complex uh, combinatorial optimization problems uh, resulting from very interesting problems in, for example, multi-agent systems. So, so one problem that we have been studying is what's called combinatorial assignment. Uh, so this is a class of problem where you have a a set of uh, elements, for example, uh, people, and you have a set of things that you would like to, to uh, have these people do, uh, but you don't want them to do this individually, but actually forming groups. So what you want to do is that you want to form teams uh, consisting of several of these individuals and then assign them to, uh, for example, tasks uh, to do so that uh, the overall objective is optimized. So for example, it could be social welfare or expected utility. So you can basically choose the kind of um, uh, uh, value function or sorry, the cost function that you want to, to optimize here. But, but the problem is of course, that both of these problems are empty hard problems. And uh, so normally they have been treated separately, but what we do is that we treat them together so we treat both of these problems at the same time as one uh, combinatorial optimization problem. And then we have, uh, and actually this problem is very hard. We, we have some uh, formal, uh, uh, formal characterizations of this uh, was uh, accepted to, to Amos here. Uh, and, um, but it's also not approximable. We can prove that you cannot even approximate this. So, so it means that it is really a challenging uh, optimization problem. And here, and what's also interesting with this particular problem is that it uh, generalizes a large range of uh, problems. And I do think maybe the most important one of this is common, the, the, the winner determination problem in combinatorial auctions. So basically given a set of uh, bids, how do you select uh, which bids to, to accept uh, in a combinatorial auction? That's a special case of this. 
but we'll also see multiple vehicle routing or multiple TSPs. That's also a special case uh, of this and, and many others. Uh, collision structure generation, for example. So this is a very general set uh, or a very general class of problems. And what we have done is then to, uh, of course, develop the, the kind of uh, state of the art exact algorithms. But we also developed state of the art uh, uh, heuristic algorithms. And what we're now very much interested in, can we, or actually we can uh, show that we can use learning to learn heuristics for this particular optimization, for this particular problem, which are then better than both the exact method, which of course, but also the best uh, kind of manual heuristics that we can come up with. Uh, and I really think this is a very general and interesting type of approach where you're actually using learning to learn heuristics to uh, uh, improve your optimizer on particular uh, 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 cases. So in this case, we are actually solving the full problem. So we're trying to approximate this for the general case. But I do think there is many interesting cases where you uh, basically uh, adapt or tailor your optimizer for certain domains. Uh, and uh, for those of you who have been working with uh, a lot of uh, I mean, programming, you might have heard about this uh, partial evaluation. So you basically could do partial evaluation of your program, giving some input, and then get a new program that is specialized to this particular partial input. Uh, so in some sense, this is what you can do for optimization. So you basically do partial evaluation of your optimizer for certain types of domains and doing that uh, through learning. So I really think this is an interesting example of combining uh, learning and, and uh, reasoning or learning and optimization, maybe. So these were two examples from, from my own research. Uh, the last uh, section here, I want to talk about uh, Taylor, which is this uh, ICT48 network uh, that I'm coordinating. Um, so, so this, as, as you probably know, that Europe has uh, four uh, of these ICT48 networks and one coordinating and support action. So, so IDA is then uh, uh, originating from AI for Media, which is another one of these four networks. Uh, and um, uh, the, the really the vision, what we are uh, want to uh, achieve through this network is to develop the scientific foundations for trustworthy AI. And what we mean by this is that we really want to develop these technical solutions to realize this uh, European vision of trustworthy AI. And that we strongly believe that we will not be able to do that with any individual technique, but rather we need to combine multiple different techniques uh, because they have different strengths and different weaknesses. Uh, so that's why I, that's our starting point that we really need to integrate learning, optimization, and reasoning to achieve this vision. And uh, in some sense, what we are really about is, of course, to actively bring together communities. Because what we see today is that these different perspectives are, are, are being uh, uh, researched in different research communities. So we have really uh, excellent uh, communities in all these different areas, but we are not working enough together. So this is one of the things we want to do to actively bring these communities together, especially when it comes to reasoning and learning. Uh, and of course, we do this in both academic and industrial network, but really with the vision and the capability of developing the scientific foundation to realize this European vision of human-centered trustworthy AI. So, so basically what we are doing is boosting the capacity in Europe to tackle major scientific challenges in these areas. So for example, we, are, we have our core network of partners. We actually have 54 uh, partners. Uh, and we also have a mechanism for adding or extending the network with network members uh, and also funding to, to support this. Uh, and then we have five what we call virtual research environments covering different uh, research topics. Uh, and we're also working more on a strategic level with roadmaps and uh, more coordinated uh, actions and so on. So, so the five uh, research environments that we're working with uh, are these space. We have two, what we call horizontal, uh, work, well, scientific work packages, one on trustworthy AI, which of course is tying uh, all of this together. But the second one is really about integrating paradigms and representations, which of course is the core of this combining reasoning and learning. And then we have three verticals, uh, one studying acting. Uh, so basically how to, yeah, do things. Uh, the second is about social. Uh, so how do we interact uh, between different agents and how do we also interact between AI systems and, and humans? 
Uh, and last but definitely not least, we also have auto AI. So basically, how can we automate parts of these processes? How can we democratize the access to these kind of sophisticated tools so that you don't need uh, a, 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 well, a long education and uh, having a lot of detailed technical knowledge, but actually we can start to deploy this in more domains so that domain experts can start using them. Uh, and, and I should really say that we're working with, with some of the best researchers uh, in, in the world when it comes to this. So the trustworthy AI is, is led by Umberto Scratch. We also have Profka Gionotti involved there. Uh, the paradigms and representation is led by Luc Derat. Uh, this work package on acting is led by Giuseppe Di Giacomo. And we also have Hector Geffner playing a leading role there. Uh, the, the work package on social is led by Anna Paiva. And Auto AI is led by Holger Hoos. So we see that we have uh, really eminent people working on these different uh, work packages. So when it comes to these paradigms and representation, which, which I would say is, is probably the, the, the kind of core technical part, uh, which as I said, is, is led by Luc Derat and, and many of these slides actually come from him. So thank you very much. Uh, and here we're really interested in how can we combine uh, these different types of approaches in different systematic ways. So for example, we have logic and probability, which is kind of the, the staple of uh, reasoning approaches. So you have either the more logical approach, uh, logical reasoning, or you have the more probabilistic reasoning. And then you can combine this to probably, I mean, for example, this probabilistic signal temporal logic that, that I presented earlier as one example of combining these. Uh, or you have uh, uh, neural approaches together with logic approaches. You get these uh, neurosymbolic approaches where you combine uh, deep learning with, with uh, more logical approaches to AI. For example, by adding constraints that your uh, neural optimizer, or I mean your optimizer for the, the, the neural network needs to, to satisfy or other ways of integrating this uh, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So what we really want to do is to bring different communities together and to combine these different approaches in different ways and learn what works and what does not work. So, so one example here is from the work that uh, of uh, uh, yeah, Luc Derath and colleagues, for example, Thomas Winters, uh, that they've been working on this neurosymbolic AI where they, they have this uh, deep problog uh, system where you basically add a, a, a uh, what you say, a, a predicate or a function in, in your uh, logical system, which is then trained using neural network. But what's interesting is, of course, that you can then constrain this learning through the reasoning done by this uh, system. So, for example, you could have a constraint that the two digits that you do your image recognition on, say two plus two equals four, and then they need to satisfy these constraints. And then you can show that you can actually, the, the, the convergence for this is faster. And, and then you can also integrate this with more probabilistic information. So instead of having your rules or uh, similar being either true or false, you can now have probabilistic rules. Uh, so you can combine this also with this probabilistic uh, reasoning uh, and so on and so forth. So you can extend this in a number of different uh, ways uh, and really get the best benefits of these different approaches, the more logic programming, the, the deep learning, the probabilistic, uh, approaches in a single uh, unified system uh, where you can then uh, work with these kind of problems. So I think that's one very interesting uh, idea. Uh, a second approach uh, which is has been worked on for a long time by the Brady Group in Bologna, uh, including Michela Milano and Michele Lombardi, uh, is again about this combining uh, of optimization and learning, where they basically have this very large and complex uh, optimization problems uh, uh, and uh, but where instead of uh, you basically model the system using a, a learning mechanism and then you convert this uh, machine learned models into constraints or predicates into your uh, constraint optimization problem and then you can uh, again apply your uh, reasoning on top of that or your constraint uh, optimization uh, solver uh, on top of this. So you basically, again, this is a way of then combining these different techniques. And that has been applied, for example, to uh, traffic light placement. So uh, the question here is, where should we add or remove traffic lights in a city in order to optimize the flow of the traffic? 
uh, uh, and uh, of course you might have constraints that you want this kind of green wave so that you only need to stop at most once uh, on the major uh, through what you call it uh, ways through the city um, and, and then uh, then you can do this basically of course I mean actually I mean the, 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 the problem here is that modeling this exactly is really difficult so in some sense you are replacing the human modeling with this learning model modeling and then you apply your uh, optimization on top of that learn model of the environment as one example uh, so so as I said also this trustworthy part is of course this the second uh, theme that's really uniting uh, the work that we are doing uh, and here we're working along these six different dimensions of trustworthy AI with explainability, safety, fairness, accountability, privacy, and sustainability, uh, which is then grounded in these ethical guidelines. Uh, and here, uh, one example uh, is worked by uh, uh, Franco Alberto Cadillo and Umberto Straccia, uh, where they have integrated fussy reasoning plus machine learning to get this kind of explainable or interpretable result, where you basically learn uh, classifiers for, for concepts such as old or high or uh, speculated or irregular. Uh, so you basically learn classifiers for these, and then you combine that with an ontology uh, to, to combine this and then use that to explain what you see in, for example, an image as the example here. Uh, so again, this is an example where you're actually combining this kind of reasoning and learning in order to, to uh, uh, achieve a more trustworthy result, or in this case, more interpretable uh, result. So the third, uh, 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 the third kind of type of example I want to use here, the final one, is really about this uh, reasoning and uh, uh, agents and learning agents. It's really about this more uh, agent paradigm or acting paradigm. Where, where we're seeing this kind of traditional way of, of building uh, intelligent agents uh, through, through reasoning. For example, we have this kind of sense plan act in the kind of uh, most extreme case, or we might have a completely uh, learning system. For example, we're using reinforcement learning to basically do trial and error in a systematic manner to learn uh, what works and what does not work uh, in interacting with the environment, given some specific goal that we want to achieve. And of course, the control by these rewards that we get from the system when we try different actions. So what we're really interested in is how can we combine this so we get both a reasoning and learning agent. So for example, can we uh, learn rewards uh, from the environment or can we learn actions uh, and so on. And can we uh, reason about this so that we can, for example, do this kind of monitoring that, that I talked about earlier uh, so that we might learn how to do different uh, acting, but then of course we want to monitor and make sure that uh, the acting that we do is actually safe and that it satisfies all these constraints. So, so, so um, uh, I do think that's very interesting. So here we have, uh, for example, um, uh, Giuseppe Di Giacomo, who has done a lot of uh, research on this. Uh, and what one of the, the, the interesting directions here is that can we now actually do reinforcement learning on non-Markovian domains? So that it's not only about looking at the previously, because I mean, uh, today, I mean, reinforcement learning is basically done on MDPs or part, I mean, POMDPs, uh, uh, but all of them making the Markovian assumption that basically the current state is enough uh, to determine the optimal uh, uh, action. And here we're interested in how can we generalize this uh, so we can basically uh, learn, for example, autonomous, uh, sorry, automatas uh, for dealing with this uh, and actually uh, dealing with that we need to actually remember which, uh, uh, so the, it's not enough to have the current state, but we also need to know how we ended up in the current state uh, and that different kind of trajectories might lead to different states and so on. So uh, this, I think, is very interesting and uh, ongoing work that we're, we're doing. So, so what are then the kind of next step? I mean, what is really the way forward here? And, and I really think, I mean, they're, they're basically, I would say that there are two components here. First of all, we have this, how can we combine these more data-driven approaches with this more knowledge-based or assumption-based 
uh, approaches, model-based approaches. Uh, so we can really kind of take the best from, from these different approaches. But also, how can we move away from these purely correlation-based approaches to more causality-based approaches? Because in the end, what we normally want to do is, of course, to, to make decisions and influence the environment. And then we really need to know I mean, correlation is not sufficient. We also need to know the kind of direction of this correlation. And I, I mean, you all know the kind of traditional example that uh, there's a strong correlation between the number of ice cream sold and the number of people drowning. And of course, it will not help if you forbid the ice cream from being sold. That will unfortunately not reduce the number of people drowning because of course, the, the common factor is probably that it's sunny and warm outside. So people both buy ice cream and they go swimming and so on. So, so of course we want this kind of uh, explanatory power uh, and then we want to use these causal models uh, to both explain the past, to basically explain what has happened, but also to do more sophisticated predictions about the future. So, I mean, today, I mean, a lot of these uh, predictions are basically what you say, averaging out. Uh, and we really need, I mean, for example, uh, I remember, I, I know that was a few years back, but it was about this, basically taking a uh, video sequence and then extrapolating what will happen next in this uh, video sequence. And it was very obvious that it basically blurred and blurred and blurred until it was just blurred. And I mean, it was the examples where someone was, for example, holding a base. Uh, and of course, then basically there are two options. Either you, well, put the base on the table next to you or you drop the base. And you basically have to kind of discrete choices uh, and that you cannot just average out taking some the, that you really need these kind of discrete uh, alternative futures that you need to uh, explicitly reason with and, and deal with. So, so that is really where I believe like the, 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 the next step the moving forward in these directions. So of course, that is what we're working on in this uh, Taylor uh, network. And I also say that, I mean, we have this, as I said, these mechanisms for working with external um, uh, organizations so that we actually have what we call a connectivity fund, uh, where it's possible to apply to do joint uh, projects together with Taylor partners. Uh, so basically there's funds for travel and sustain sustenance. Uh, so you can uh, either visit a Taylor uh, partner or someone from a Taylor partner who could come and visit you. Uh, and we have three calls every year and the next call uh, closes on March 15th. So this is an opportunity. So, so uh, to conclude, uh, I, I think, I mean, I do think that this uh, research, I mean, there are so many challenging research problems related to actually achieving this vision of human-centered trustworthy AI. But I, I do think there are other aspects that are also really key to this. And the first one is, of course, that I don't believe in this, say, pure automation. I think this pure automation will be something very rare for example, in outer space or maybe in deep sea exploration or something like that, um, where there are very, I mean, basically no people at all, but everything else will have a major component of human AI interaction. I mean, just taking a self-driving car, even if the car is driving by itself, it needs to interact with the passengers in the car, and then we need to interact with people or, or other uh, vehicles outside uh, the car. So of course it needs a huge component of this human AI interaction. I also strongly believe that uh, it's not about either AI or humans, but more that we can combine. I mean, I do think we have different strengths and different weaknesses and that by collaborating, we will be able to solve uh, more challenging problems uh, together. And I also think that education is really a, a challenge here that, I mean, I see this more and more that we are, I mean, organization approaching us wanting to do collaborations and uh, often they have a very vague or even well, incorrect uh, uh, expectation of what these kind of techniques can do. Usually they have really high expectation. Oh, you just apply your fancy AI method and you can solve any problem. How difficult can it be? And here's a bunch of data, here's a hard drive. And, and uh, usually, the, of course, the data is just crap. Uh, I mean, it's usually very low uh, quality and you cannot even do anything. And uh, you need to educate them both in, in kind of how to collect data in a more, uh, uh, efficient manner, but also have a more realistic perspective on what these techniques can and cannot do. 
And, and last but definitely not least, I really think we need to work much more in ecosystems. I don't believe that any organization or any uh, individual institution will be able to solve all these problems, but we really need to work together and that we need to focus on different aspects and then uh, help each other out in order to address these major challenges that, that we are really facing here. And I, I should emphasize that, I mean, I do believe that AI will be a significant part of basically every solution. However, it will not be the only, <laughs> it will not be the solution in itself, but I do think it will be a component uh, of, of, of many of the, the solutions to the major challenges that we as a, a society and as a humanity overall is, is facing today with, for example, energy and uh, clean water and pollution. And I mean, uh, all these uh, sustainable development and so on. I really think that these kind of techniques are, are essential to achieve those visions, but we really need to, to work together. And I really think that actually Europe is starting to get a quite good ecosystem. I mean, I used to talk about the Swedish AI ecosystem, which I do think is actually very good, where we have both large, pri uh, well, pub, um, uh, uh, basic research initiatives, where more initiatives towards education, we have initiatives more to application or, or kind of accelerating the use of AI through AI Sweden and so on. And that we actually work together uh, very much on the national level. And we see now that we're also seeing similar things being uh, starting to happen on the European sea, which I do think is super important and very, very uh, nice. So to conclude, I mean, I really think the key here is that Europe has taken this, uh, I, I would argue, very good position that yes, we want AI and we definitely want AI that we can trust and that AI in itself is not really the, 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 the end goal, but it's a means to achieve other objectives. Uh, and that in order for this, uh, and of course the consequence of that is that will, AI will affect basically all parts of our society. And of course that also means that trust will be essential. And I do think we are at this kind of tipping point where, where uh, if we don't regain the trust in these systems, people might start to really be, be uh, what you say, disengaged with this. And then uh, we will have a major uphill challenge to, to uh, win back this trust. So I really think this is really important. And of course, to, to be trustworthy, we need is to be left, uh, satisfy these legal uh, and requirements and ethical principles and be robust. But I do think there is major, major uh, research challenges in order to achieve this. And that is what, for example, this Taylor uh, project is really dedicated to, to develop these scientific foundations. And I would strongly believe that in order to do this, we need to combine these more data-driven uh, learning-based approaches with these more model-based or knowledge-driven uh, reasoning approaches. And of course, never forget that it's all about humans and AI together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oplik. Um, oh, people are saying uh, thanks. And uh, any kind of question? If you have questions, you can raise your hand or directly ask. Um, okay, so we have uh, consulting else you could ask. You. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Mm. All right. Um, first of all, thank you for the very informative talk uh, today. So I would like to ask, um, in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned how the assessment of an AI application uh, is currently done comparatively to the human perception and decision-making process, um, either in Go or in uh, medical applications. So what I wanted to ask is, uh, when you mentioned one of the four pillars of um, the initiative of Europe for an AI, and particularly the ethical AI, um, how can an engineer or scientist or a user in general uh, decide and judge whether the decision made is ethical? I mean, it could be um, bizarre from a human perspective, but on the long, in the long run, and I guess you can say ethically, the, the machine decision would be more fair. I don't know if my question was actually... 
so so i mean of course that is the million dollar question <laughs> that i mean how do you actually verify that the system is uh, ethical or trustworthy and so on so i mean i mean what we see today is of course that there is a lot of uh, uh, different research uh, directions i mean i mentioned some of them but i also see that there is a major trend towards standardization so basically finding best practices so basically agreeing upon that well here is the if you follow these uh, best practices then we kind of uh, agree that uh, this is uh, what should I ethical or at least sufficiently satisfy this this particular principle when it comes to say uh, logging or um, being able to 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 trace the system and being able to uh, generate what say ex some form of explainable output. But I want to say one thing regarding this uh, what say uh, evaluating and and what I really think is the challenge is having uh, reasonable baselines and, and I mean it seems like I mean one baseline was I mean the, the example I gave basically purely kind of objective that uh, uh, a human would not do it that way so therefore it must be wrong but I think the other uh, false kind of baseline is really around uh, being uh, with omni <laughs> omni what's it called I mean basically never making any mistakes so basically the the kind of optimal answer given that you know the future kind of thing that it, we also have this expectation that uh, if it's an automated system you should never make any mistakes while of course for humans we we accept mistakes all the time because we are making a bunch of mistakes all, every day but still we, we manage to get around so I really think finding the reasonable baseline, on which to compare your systems and then of course we want these systems to be significantly better than humans but maybe we don't we cannot expect them to be perfect and never make any mistakes so see that we have a bunch of questions yes uh, yes here. i got a question that was before that so was sent to me uh, petre Timi, maybe you want to ask it or yeah actually, okay. actually good afternoon i'm in the united states now uh, almost lunchtime. Uh, thank you for your great presentation. I'm an old guy with an uh, expert system 30 years ago. It was a, a hope at that time, then a big valley. The question is, uh, facts is that we do not have trust in the social media information and we have much difficulties to identify fake news and identify defamation so fighting with the bad guys. Now, putting this on an artificial way, the very same thing in, in terms of trusting appears with the bad guys or application intentionally or not. So now we talk about decisions. So what is your vision in terms of education? Because there are skilled, as you mentioned, and unskilled people. And then they might be cheated just unintentionally. What is your vision on when educating whatever you think it's Taylor and Claire and other AI uh, uh, projects are doing. So, I mean, I definitely agree that I, I do th think education is probably the best to kind of vaccination against uh, uh, this kind of dis disinformation. Uh, and uh, I really, I mean, I, I'm, as, as Mohammed mentioned in the introduction, I'm very much involved in, in a lot of different uh, educational activities. And actually, we, we recently got funding to work on the national level with uh, AI education. And, and, and I really think this, how do we make people more aware about, I mean, what this I mean, for example, I think a good example is, I mean, it's not really about disinformation, but this you basically get these kind of questionnaires that, oh, what's your favorite movie or uh, all these kind of things, which of course is very much to collect data about you. And just being aware that uh, answering these kind of surveys is a way for these systems to, to collect data about you. Uh, or that, I mean, uh, just the, being aware of the fact that you can basically generate text, images, video, sounds, everything that's more or less indistinguishable from, from the, the real thing. Uh, and I really think we need to be much more uh, aware. Uh, and, uh, and I mean, I do think it's also very much related to this issue of cyber security, because I do think a lot of this kind of security issues is also related to, to education. So, I mean, yeah. what are we doing on a practical level? I mean, one is this uh, elements of AI, which is this course developed by University of Helsinki in Finland. 
uh, which we are, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, hosting that in Sweden uh, and uh, we have translated it to Swedish and we're giving university credits for those that take this course. Uh, so I do think that's one way of really kind of raising the lowest bar uh, of people learning a bit more. So, I mean, of course, it's just kind of small numbers, but still we have more than 3000 people which actually take it out the university credits for that. And we have, I don't remember, 14,000 or something like that that has completed the course. So, so uh, I do think we need more of these kind of uh, initiatives which are targeting a broad audience. Uh, so, so, so I well, we have some ideas, but we haven't done more. And I do think that's super important. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have still some questions. I have one question from uh, Brandon. Maybe you could ask him. Yes, hello. Uh, yes. Hopefully, you can hear me. Yes, fine. Uh, so thanks for the great talk. Uh, you've been talking about AI systems where uh, fundamentally the systems are controlling some kind of uh, uh, mechanism or, or UAV or flying machine or something where trust is sort of confined to believing that it will operate within the constraints that have been defined for those systems. Uh, and I'm really curious uh, what you envision for fairness uh, for some systems which are much more contentious uh, for example, uh, personnel hiring practices, uh, screening and, and selection of personnel for jobs, where uh, it's much harder to define exactly what those constraints are and what the fairness goals are. How do people learn to trust systems like that? So, I mean, I do think it's very good. And I do think this is probably one of those examples where having a I mean, first of all, having a reasonable uh, baseline, because I mean, my my, my uh, I would expect that I mean, most most human decisions are biased so in some sense what we want to understand is i mean how biased are current human decisions and how can we make these systems less biased or rather i mean different kind of bias as i would imagine so for example when it comes to hiring i mean there is a lot of research on this for example when it comes to uh, uh, musicians that in some sense by not seeing the musicians i mean if you or rather if you see the musician then you will uh, for example treat men and women differently but if you don't see them if you just listen to the way they play then we reduce the bias of, of humans in, in making those kind of decisions on who to hire for your orchestra and i do think we probably need the same kind of things here that in some sense what are the kind of information or signal or features or whatever uh, that that we can use uh, and still being able to uh, deduce or i mean reduce uh, the, the bias in these decisions. But there, of course, the, the, the challenge here is that, I mean, if you take a hiring, I mean, hiring a decision, for example, I mean, there is no objectively right or wrong. I mean, of course, some people will was a, be a bad match for the job, but I mean, some might actually look like a bad match, but being able to 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 turn around. And, and here, I really think that the, the, what I really think is the challenge here is to have static systems. I, I think it will be very challenging to to try to just have a single system and then uh, try to verify that it never makes any mistake but rather it needs to be uh, adaptive so for example that uh, I mean when you hire people then you say oh was this a good fit or, or less good fit and then you try to improve this over time uh, so so I really think that probably we need to rather than expect them to be perfect from the start to improve over time if we can get them to improve over time, so for example, decrease uh, the, the bias and increase the, the quality of the, the output, I think that is what we want to, to, to aim for, getting a more feedback into these systems. Because as you say, we don't have any objective uh, things to, to compare to. Okay. And when it comes to trust, I also think that people will probably trust this system very easily and probably too easily. So in some sense, I, in some sense, I, I think a challenge here is to how to avoid people trusting systems that they should uh, that they shouldn't trust <laughs> and i think that's a, also a problem or a challenge yeah okay great uh, i see that mohana sridhan uh, you want to yeah. you want to ask a question yeah, uh, yes after mm. five can you hear me yes, yes. Mm. Okay, cool. Uh, so, um, so I had a, a question um, related to uh, probably the um, 
uh, more on the problem formulation uh, kind of thing. So, so you talked about this, uh, what was at least very interesting to me, this humans and AI uh, working together in the future and stuff, right? So um, initially, I mean, I'm sure you know this, like, you know, the, when AI was initially started, there was a lot of interest in trying to like, you know, uh, look at look at not just at computational systems, but also to try and understand human reasoning, human learning, and use that as a basis, at least at the behavioral level, not at the level of neurons or whatever, not to try and build better computational uh, models for these artificial systems. So, so I wonder, and in that sense, uh, there has been, I mean, not in all domains, but in many practical domains, there is a, a research to show that it's not like system one and system two, it's often sort of like, you know, other kinds of mechanisms that help you make rapid decisions. Uh, and it's not about optimization, it's about sometimes like, you know, things like old school thing would be satisfying, like, you know, a rational behavior and so on. And it's not about trying to get 92 instead of 91, right? And that's what really gives you interesting behavior. So, so I was wondering how you would, I mean, I mean, I know you didn't talk about that here, but I was wondering how you see all that fit into this grand picture, because in some sense to me, that would help provide better answers to things like ethical, legal and stuff, because you wouldn't try and say, okay, this is the gold standard or the standardized output, but instead you would say it is highly contextual. And for this context, if I know what the underlying mechanism is, it would still give me the um, right decision that I would like to take. Right, and I'm not trying to optimize and get again a particular percentage. So I was just trying to see what your views are. So, so there is a lot of important things there. So, I mean, I think one comment is actually, uh, I mean, for example, regarding this kind of causal uh, reasoning. I mean, what I think is often the case is that when we do say more of this kind of correlation-based approaches, statistical approaches, we are not we are not being explicit about the assumptions that we make. And I think uh, part of this context problem that you're, you're referring to can probably be solved by being explicit about the assumptions uh, that we made when we collected the data, for example, so that we know how to interpret this. And now we actually are in a different context, and then we can contextualize uh, the, the, the information that we, we have to this new setting. So I do think that's part of the answer. And I also agree with this. I mean, both this when it comes to say satisfying rather than uh, optimizing and and uh, uh, not reading this kind of numeric. So I mean, I do think there's a lot of challenges with this numerical, uh, um, purely numerical uh, estimations. I mean, I gave this example with this uh, predicting the future of a person holding a vase. And I mean, I, I would argue that's a very discrete uh, difference, I mean, in this kind of different developments, then of course, given the two choices, there is of this continuous movement of everything, but I really think we need to have more discrete uh, representations and more discrete uh, kind of uh, reasonings in order so that we can get away from these purely numerical uh, representations. But of course, that's, that's quite challenging to, to combine this. Uh, and then when it, when it comes to interacting with humans, I actually think that's when we need this more, what you say, symbolic approaches, or I mean, I, I call it abstraction that, because we we cannot deal with this huge amounts of data, we need much more, in some sense simpler or more uh, condensed uh, representations. And then we then I, I think we also again, need to move away from this maybe continuous state representations to something more discrete to get something which we can uh, work better with to, to uh, improve this human AI interaction. Thanks. Um, we take our last question uh, because Kuma was there uh, asking that for a long time. Yeah. Kuma? No. So yeah, I have a question that uh, in the one slide before, just before this slide, you talked that we can fuse, combine together data and knowledge together. So my question is what kind of model is there which can combine data and knowledge at the same point of time? Yeah, in this model, because in classical deep learning, you can come, you, I don't think you can combine the knowledge because really they are not differentiable. So do you have to come up with some different kind of the model itself or we can use the existing deep learning model to combine both of them? So, I mean, there, I mean, that's what we're studying in this uh, different representation, different ways of representing and integrating paradigms. And there, there are a number of different ways. I mean, one way is try to get differentiable rules. So for example, instead of having strict rules, you can have them more as a kind of constraint. So you want to minimize the loss uh, of your logical formula. So for example, you can then have, uh, uh, say that your, your, your variables in your neural network represent 
uh, different variables and then you can have a logical constraint for example that the the sum of the two first can never be more than the, the third and then you put that as a loss function rather than as a true or false uh, and then you can use that as part of your loss function when you learn uh, the weights of your neural network that's a different approach so so uh, so and this neurosymbolic approach this uh, deep problem they I mean they integrate it in a different way so I would say that there this is one of the again one of these open questions how to do this in the best way uh, and there are several different approaches that are currently being uh, explored thank you got it thank you we are already uh, past the time so thanks again uh, for that. And, uh, uh, Mohammed, yes, uh, yeah. before we finish, Frederick, I just got into your slides to get this report of yours in this committee on trustworthy AI, and I think that the link is broken. Okay, that uh, changed it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. So if you send it to me or post it somewhere, that would be nice, because I'm interested in this report. Okay. <laughs> thank you again for the camp. Thank okay, you. Thank you. For two for of you, and um, uh, you could have access uh, after to the uh, to the video and to the slides on the website of uh, Ida as usual. And thank you again for for your contributions. Bye. Bye. Bye.